literary agent with Mansion Street Literary Management, and I work with children's books mostly, um, board books, and um, young adults. Um, and I do write as well. I've mostly published nonfiction humor books. The most recent is about Bob Ross, because Bob Ross is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I am Catherine Purdy. I am the author of the Burning Glass series with Harper Collins, and then I've got a new duology coming out with them. The first one comes out next year, and it's called Bone Grace, and they are young adult fantasy novels. I'm Taylor Rachel Branton. Um, I write urban fantasy, also dystopian adult, and under Taylor Branton and under Rachel, Rachel Branton, I write romances. And I've got about 60 books out. I just go to my website, sign up, <laughs> get a few for free. Uh, hi, I'm Christopher Husberg. Sorry, what was that? Did somebody? You have to speak more directly into the Oh, mic. okay. Oh, oh yeah, okay. You have to eat the mic. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, uh, yeah Christopher Husberg. Uh, I am a dark epic fantasy author. My first, the first book in my uh, series, The Chaos Queen Quintet, came out in 2016, Duskfall, uh, and I'm writing, I'm revising actually, so this is appropriate, uh, I'm actually going through the final pass of book four in the series, that'll be out in June. Um, yeah, that's it. Sorry, I guess we actually, this mic over yeah, here. We yeah, we actually, oh yeah, there we go, we'll split. perfect, yeah. Okay, so hopefully, um, you know, for those who've been here for a couple days and those who are starting today and um, getting going, you'll know that <coughs> With writing and any part of that process is not a one size fits all. And you'll definitely see that in this panel with revising. Everyone has their own process. And so with all of this, when you're going throughout the conference, take what works for you or you think will be helpful and don't worry about the rest. So with this one, don't feel like you have to try every single method. If you want to try them, go for it. But don't feel like one of us is right while the others are wrong. It's just personal. So let's get started then. Um, and with re revising, I think it probably needs to start out with us discussing our writing process because that influences and affects how we revise. Um, personally, I've written manuscripts one in three weeks where I just tore through the entire thing and then others, you know, several years, um, and have gone through and revised throughout the process. And so I've seen both sides of it. Um, but we can go through and talk about the um, writing process and how that influences how you revise. Um, so I'm a really heavy plotter. I spend like usually a year to 18 months just like with the idea percolating and then I do like a big research period and I plot and do a lot of pre-writing and then I and then I write the book and I'm a slow writer too and I don't know if it's just a slow writer thing or just me but I my tendency in my first drafts is to really overwrite and I think that might just, you know, when you were reading it back and you're reading it faster than the slow, slow writing pace, you pick up pacing issues. So, and my, so then my issues that I have to focus on in revision is a lot of cutting and tightening. Um, but usually I get the, the core plot and character things right because of all my pre-writing time. So it's just um, usually more about honing in on everything, tightening it up. Um, I mean, I'll cut like, any, I've cut between like 50 and 80,000 words in my revisions, so wow. it's a lot. <laughs> I know, it's really, and I write young adults, so my books have to be fast paced. They're not like super short, like Burning Glass, um, I think is 123,000 words, which is, a lot. I mean, most young adult fantasies, I would say, are like 75 to 90. 100,000 is a good amount. Yeah. But then, um, I tend, my first drafts tend to be about 90. Sometimes if I have to rewrite the book, that's when they get really inflated. I don't know why. Like, rewrite the whole idea from scratch. Like, it's still like 150, 160. I usually bring it down, except for, for burning glass, I usually can bring them down closer to 100 or a little under. But that's usually my issue, like what I have to focus on in revision. Okay, well, maybe, hello? Can you hear me? So I, I did write down a few little things about what I do, like, um, what's your name? Catherine. Uh, Catherine, I gotta remember this. I'm so terrible with names. Like Catherine, I also you know, think about um, the stories and, and stuff beforehand. 
Um, but when I start to write, I sit down and I, I write like, okay, these are my characters. And if it's a series, then I have my character sheet from my last book. So I just, so I, and whenever I'm writing a character or writing about the character, I will copy and paste whatever I described because I, I, I like to write series. And so I copy and paste and I just paste it right into my character document so that I always have that. So I don't have to go and search my document, you know, after now, well, who was that minor character and what did he look like and what did, you know, what were his quirks? I can just go and look. But so I, I'll take a few minutes and set that up and like the characters I know I'm not going to use in this book, they were just, you know, I'll just push down to the bottom and say not, not going to use. And then I, I already have the setting and stuff in my mind. I then I just start writing. I a lot of times I will write down at the bottom of the page. I'm more of a pantster, um, and I'm usually a very fast writer. In in the old days, I would always do what I call tithe my books, and I would always try and take out at least 10% of my books. And now I often find that. <laughs> Some of my scenes are really overwritten, especially where it's the emotion that I'm trying to capture. And then in my way through, I will take out stuff like there. But in other places, when I've written my first draft, I'll see, I've just put XXX, look up this. So she's already done the research. <laughs> I just say XXX, I think it's this way, and I write the scene. And then I will, when I run into an X, I will go and look that up. So that's how I kind of set up the document. and. Um, and as ideas come to me, or when I'm writing something I know I need to re tie back in, I will write it down at the bottom of the, the page. And so basically when I get down to the end and there's no more notes down there, I'm done with the book pretty much. And one thing though that has helped me in the past when I have run into, you know, maybe I kind of dread going to the computer for a while and I'm thinking, and that's always when you don't know what you're gonna write. And at that time I will take and, and you know, do research and sit down and kind of plot a little bit more and say, okay, I need this to happen, I need this to happen, I need this to happen, let's see, let's do it in this order. And then after I do that, I put, paste it all right down at the bottom of my, of my computer screen and just keep going. And so that's kind of how I do it. Um, I also, I always write the book, then I rewrite the book, and that takes so long, the second one, because I'm more, I, lis I listen to it and I write it. I, I listen to it, and then I do it again, and I listen to it, and that time is not as bad. You know, I'm just more like doing typos and fine tuning and taking out some of the sap that I still left in there because I, you know. Then after that, I ha I send it out to some some readers, some of my readers, to kind of test it out and see what, see if I got it right or not. And then from there goes to editing. And am I allowed to take questions? She's, yeah. Okay. I just wanted a clarification. Do you? You said you listen to it. Do you okay, I, I type with Word, and so I go up there and I actually will highlight highlight it. And I didn't do, used to do this in the olden days. It takes much longer, but I find so much more. And I know authors who read it out to them themselves. And if I don't do this, I, I miss so much. And so I found that since I started to do that, I started to do that. I've been writing for, what, 20 two years I've been publishing, and I just started this probably three years ago, to actually listen to every single thing, but not the first time How through. How do you do it, though? Oh, okay, so I go into Word, and there's a little thing that you can add, it's called the Speak feature, and you add it to your ribbon. Uh, you know, maybe I better do a blog on this. Just email me and I'll, I'll send you the, the, the exact directions, okay? It's just Taylor at taylorbranton.com. And um, then you just highlight it and it reads it back to you. There's also another feature where you can just push, click, and it will read it to you and keep going. But I don't like that one because I only like to do sections at a time. And that way then I stop and I do. And these are for the revisions, though. It's never do this for the very first, the, you know, the first go through. But I find that if I do that, when I, and I do that twice, and when I go, um, when my editors come back, they have so little, like in the typo thing. It's more like, oh, you need to revise, you know, I don't, I need more in this, um, in this scene, I need more of this, I, I need this feeling, add this. And so it's less of the, oh, your typos are crazy, you know? And plus, I can kind of get the feel, and over the years, I used to put so much sap in my book. I just recently got some books back from my editor, or from my, my former publisher, and I could not believe 
how bad they were, and I don't know how they got published. I really don't. But you know what? It was a different world ten years, even ten years ago, and and so I'm yanking stuff out and rewriting entire scenes because so. You know, just do the very best you can do, and then ask for help and to exchange with with people. I think that really helps. Yeah. So I, um, it really depends on the project for me, and and even within a series, I can my process will differ depending on like deadlines and other things I have going on. So I think <laughs> I'm going to describe to you sort of my ideal writing process, which I, doesn't happen for me every time, but like in a perfect world for most books, this is what I would do. Um, I'll also mention I I started out as a pretty strict discovery writer, like I just discovery wrote everything. My first novel uh, in in the Chaos Queen series, I I discovery wrote that. It ended up being about 150,000 words. Um, book two, I was trying to discover write that novel in the series, and it ballooned like I wasn't even done with it, and it was at 270,000 words, and I was having big problems with the book because it, it was expanding instead of like progressing forward. So that's when I started to integrate a lot more um, structural and out, you know, story structure and outlining uh, methods in my in my process. But can you explain what? Oh, yeah. Explain what discovery writing is for people. Who oh, sure. Term. Of course, yeah. So discovery writing typically means that you start with with a few kind of vague or sometimes specific ideas uh, of a character and a location and a setting, um, and you just kind of start writing and you discover the story as you write. You don't do a lot of outlining or planning beforehand. Um, sort of the polar opposite of that is a, is a, someone who outlines and, and plans a lot beforehand, does extensive outlines, um, and uh, uh, yeah. But right. either way, I was just gonna say like no, neither way is wrong. Like oh, no. you either do the work in revision or you do the work in the pre-writing. You usually have to do both. Yeah. But you, the work gets done. Yeah. Yeah. Realistically, most people fall in the middle somewhere, and they yeah. do they do some of both. Um, but but there are some extremes. Like Stephen King, I'm pretty sure is almost a complete discovery writer. Um, and there are other authors that that outline very very uh, strictly and 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 carefully, and and that's how they write, and it works for them. Um, I am saying all this. Oh yeah, so my, my process. Um, so uh, I, I usually start, if, if I know that I'm gonna be doing research for a book, um, I do it beforehand. Half the time, I get halfway through a book and I'm like, oh, I better, I better research this thing, and then, it ha then I research it as I'm writing. Um, but for example, in book three uh, of my series, I was, it's, a, it's a war novel, there's lots of battles, so I was researching a number of different um, historical uh, wars and, and campaigns, and specifically the, the Punic Wars and the Second Punic War. So I was doing a lot of research there. Um, for the new series I'm working on, uh, I'm doing a lot of research into artificial superintelligence. So that's been something I've been heavily researching. And I usually do that beforehand. So that's kind of my pre-pre-writing. And then I... Uh, I try to outline um, the uh, emotional beats that each of my characters want to hit. Like I don't do a ton of outlining as far as the plot is concerned, but I do try and really nail down for my characters, you know, I want them to have this emotional arc as they go. I want them to hit these beats and uh, to get to this place, you know, emotionally and, and with maybe some relationships with other characters. Um, and, and that's usually when I start writing. Like I might do a really vague sort of plot outline um, with just some, some major points that I know I want to hit. Um, but at that point I start writing and I finish my first draft. Uh, I, I adhere, I think, so this panel's called Writing with the Door Open, How to Revise. And I've heard that, that phrase, Writing with the Door Open, from Stephen King, who I think his philosophy is to write you know, write your first draft with the door closed and then revise with the door open. And I usually take, that's usually what I do. I write the first draft with the door closed. I usually don't have a lot of input, don't really show it to anybody until I finish a first draft. And then at that point, I actually do, if I can, again, this is in an ideal world, I don't always have time to do this, but if I, if I have the time to do another revision just myself, because usually I go through a first draft and I know there are things I need to fix, you know? I know there's, I know there's some issues and some things that change and some things I want to tighten up a little bit. And so I try and fix all the things I know for a fact are already there, some of the issues that are already there. And, and that's when I, I show it to other people, to beta readers, to my agent, to my editor. Um, and then I usually get feedback from them uh, and do, do another pass or however many you know, revisions it takes until I, it's, it's in a good place. Um, I will say one thing that helps me, uh, and I don't always do this. Like if I sometimes I do outline a lot more extensively before I start writing a book. Um, but if I don't, if I mostly discovery write the book, what's really helpful for me in the revision process is to outline 
in the revision process to make an outline and say, okay, because because what's what's important about for me, I, I shouldn't, you know, everybody's different. Like we're kind of establishing up here, everybody's different. They work differently, but the way I understand stories. Um, Outlining is important because it helps me understand the the beats of a story that I need to hit. You know, the specific, you know, if, if you think about the hero's journey or, or you know, um, just your typical, like you have an inciting incident, you have a progressive complication, you have a, a crisis and a climax and then a resolution, right? You kind of have these same uh, aspects of every story. And so I, I'll outline uh, during the revision process to make sure that I'm doing these things uh, in the story. Because sometimes I don't, or sometimes I duplicate them, right? I have like three scenes that do the same thing, and I'm like, well, I don't need all these. I can get, some, get rid of some of them. Um, so that's a helpful tool for me, tool for me as well. Uh, so like I said, I have written several different types of novels. One of them, it was three, literally three weeks that I just tore through and just got the thing out of my head and then down on the page. Uh, and the one I've been working on recently, I, I've written several nonfiction manuscripts in between, so it's taken me you know, probably way too many years to work on this one. But I have done different processes on it. Um, and just with my OCD, um, like this, uh, the novel is set in the real world and it's sort of a road trip, and so I had to personally go through and use Google Maps and figure out how long it would take to drive from one location to another and do all this stuff before I could really sit down and just write it because just my brain was like, well, what time of day are they gonna get there? Well, what's gonna happen with this? And what, you know, the location, where they, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, that's not necessarily something I'd recommend because <laughs> it takes a lot more time. Um, but with this one also, you were talking about you know outlining the structure after. In this one, I had to stop as well at one point and figure out that I did it more of the three-act play type structure because I had to figure out. Um, I didn't do a formal one, but there are. I know there are books and other um, descriptions of the three-act and how you can break that down into um, you know the I guess the not inciting but the. Opposite of climax. My brain is dead today. Um, no, the uh, or the climbing, the climbing. You know, like the um, rising action. Yeah, rising action. That is what it is. Um, and then you've got that climax in there, and then you've got the resolution at the end. And so, for me at least, in this book, it, I really needed that process. And especially since it's a road trip, they were in different locations in each of them, so I had to visually see that. And I used a visual mapper. Like there are different programs and things where you can. Um, write out and move things in different locations just so I can see that visually. So it you know it really depends and oftentimes it does depend on the project too on what process you use and what that story means. Okay and so um, another question and some of you had mentioned this um, I I think it was, was Christopher. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned um, having someone read it after a certain point with the door closed. So at what point do you bring in readers? And especially if you already have an agent or an editor, what time do you bring them in? For me, I really have to have the door like slammed shut <laughs> while I draft. It's even really hard for me to um, have my editor involved at that point. Uh, it took me like a year and a half to draft my first manuscript ever, like never got published. And it took me so long because I had a critique partner and we were like exchanging every single chapter back and forth and it was just freezing me up. Like I was just gotten to perfectionist mode where I'm like rewriting this chapter over and over and over again until I'm until I feel like I'm perfectly satisfied and she's perfectly satisfied before I can write the next thing. And I just, I just can't do that anymore. I learned, I learned, and I had a critique group and we were, then we were all trying to share chapters of stuff that wasn't even finished yet. And to me, I'm like, I don't even really, even as much as I pre-write and outline, I don't really kind of know what it really is. Like it's still something that's sacred inside of me that's personal and, I'm not ready to share it until it's fully realized. Like, and it's hard to judge. Like, I'll, I do have to give, now that I'm under contract, I do have to give my editor like my synopses. But, and sometimes she has feedback on those. And almost every time, and she's a fabulous editor, but I've, we've learned 
with each other that she really needs to step away from the pre-writing, my pre-writing more, because every time she's given me a suggestion that I followed in the pre-writing, in revisions, we almost always have to go back to my original vision. And maybe it's because I write crappy synopses and I'm not like getting the idea across yeah. very well. But that's the thing is like, I, I outline like religiously, but then I veer when I'm writing like probably a third from my outline and I follow my character in the end. I try as much as possible to guess what my character will do, but you get to know these characters and they take on a life and a mind of their own and they want to do their own thing. And so I, I have to allow myself that freedom for this thing to become what it really needs to be and then for me to fix it up as best as I can before I share it. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to do all kinds of work to make it the best it can be, and I'm open to feedback afterwards, but I, I've learned that I really need to protect that artistic space from me to uh, just fully experiment and, and feel and let this, this thing become, this like seed become like a realized dream. Do, do you that feel, makes sense. Do you feel like, I have a question for her, do you feel like that initial sharing chapters with this, this other writer, do you feel like that helped you in the beginning though? I'm curious. It helped me, uh, you know what, I don't think it helped me very much. Um, it's really important, I learned finally the really hard way, it's really important to just get the project done. Let it be crap, let it, let your first draft, I mean like, do it the best you can, but like get it done. We can, it, I maybe learned a little bit about prose and stuff, but prose is just a small part, like learning how to tell a story that you, it was about pacing and tension and characters and arcs. You can't do that until you finish the entire story. And so maybe if you want to learn about story faster, maybe write short stories or things like that if you want to get through it faster. But for me, maybe for other people, it was helpful. And my particular critique partner, uh, she was just, I, I love her to death. She was one of my best friends before we started writing, but she was an extremely harsh critic, but didn't really know what she was talking about, which is really extremely harsh. So I, but because, because she was so thorough and so harsh, I thought she knows everything. And as long as I write and make her satisfied, this is going to be perfect. And my dad's a writer. And so I, I spent months and months and months just writing like three chapters. And I was so excited to show my dad my perfect story that I thought was perfect, like these three chapters. And he read a page and a half, and that's all he could get through. He marked it up completely red. And he's like, you, you're doing this all wrong. Because he, you know, he knew what he was talking about. About. He actually had the background in credentials, and he's, he just handed me a writing book and like a, a writing craft book and said, "Just read this, and then then we'll talk later." Like he didn't even—it was just so bad. And I thought it, it was perfect, so um, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I think you need to. It's so hard when you learn so many rules and get so much so much stuff into your head, so many other critics and voices. It really paralyzes you, and you can't, you gotta try as much as possible not to be paralyzed while you're drafting. Yeah. Um, after you get it out and there's something there, then you have something to work with to fix, but it's hard to finish something that you know is so problematic, if that makes sense. So that's my I, take on it. I don't even know that I can add anything to what she said because I totally agree. I don't do the, you know, the detailed outlining, but I've never been able to just exchange chapters like that. What I did in the beginning was I exchanged entire books. Um, and, and that, for me, was a lot more helpful because invariably they say, oh, why don't you do this and this and this? Well, that's good for your story, but that's not my story. And so I also have to protect that. Now, one thing, though, that was helpful, I remember in one particular series I was working on book three and I had the scene of how I wanted it to open in my mind. But I, I couldn't figure out where to go afterward. And so I remember calling up a, a writer friend of mine and saying, well, what do you think I should do? Um, 
you know what? And I, yeah, I started that. talking about yeah. it, and she said, well, why don't you do this and this? And I said, no way. My characters would never do that. And she goes, well, what about this? No way. And so I, by the end of that conversation, I, I, I said, well, I was thinking more about this. And then so by, by the end of that conversation, I had exactly all the things I didn't want it to do, and then I had those few kernels of what I did want it to do. So it, it really helped me to talk it out. But um, every time I've ever tried to exchange short short parts I, or like chapters, mm -hmm. it has always just made it worse. So I need to get my story out, protect that, like like my companions here have been saying. And you may be different. It, uh, that's why I asked yeah. you the question because I wanted it, to know if it it's really just helped. You. That's me. Because yeah. a lot of I know a lot of places, a lot of critique groups do this, and they exchange chapters very successfully. Yeah. Yeah. And all my other critique partners were fine with it. They could do it, and for me, it shut me down. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in very much the same boat. I think uh, when I kind of the start of like where I be, began to be serious about writing was when I took uh, Brandon's Brandon Sanderson's class at BYU, like. 12 years ago or something, and, and he puts you in, in writing groups, right, where you critique each other's work. And I was absolutely a discovery writer, like 100% at the time. And so I was just kind of plotting, plot, plotting is the wrong word. I was just kind plotting. of writing, right, plotting. Yeah, plotting with a D, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, not a D. Uh, you know, plodding along, uh, just kind of seeing where these characters went. It was really interesting. But every time I'd go to critique group, they'd have all this. Some of it was very helpful feedback, um, but a lot of it was just things things that were kind of uh Altering the direction I wanted to go with the story, or, or uh, you know, misunderstanding things that were going to be explained, like very shortly, um, and it was really frustrating for me and hard for me to just make progress on that project. Um, so at that point, I sort of was like, all right. After that class, I just kind of decided I'm not going to really do um, writing groups or anything, or, or get feedback until I finish a draft. Um, and I, I kind of, I. I kind of broke that uh, with so with this new project I'm working on. Uh, it's it's a new trilogy. I sent. I was talking with my agent about it. I, my agent about it, and we were um, kind of sending thoughts back and forth as I was writing the first, uh, you know, twenty or thirty thousand words or so. And I ended up sending that to him because I was like, well. Maybe he'll give me some feedback. Maybe even it's at a point where we can start setting out to get some interest in it. Um, and and his feedback was like, I mean, and in, in realistically, his feedback was very positive and good. It just wasn't as good as his as like his response to the first time I sent him a novel, which he was like very like overwhelmingly enthusiastic about that. Which understandably, that he was, you he's know, himself. yeah, he's selling himself. He wanted me to be his client. Yeah. Um, and so and so this was so that was like this is amazing. I love it. It's like the most, the best thing I've ever read. Like he was doing his job as an agent, right? Um, and with this, it was more like, hey, yeah, this is like, this is good. I think we can make it better. Right? Here are some things that I think we need to keep in mind as we go. Um, but but here's here are my thoughts, and I think it's going to be great. And, and I took that to be like, ah, like this is not good. It's not going the direction that he wants it to go. And uh, and I. I mean, and I, I know my process at this point. Like, I know that even when I heavily outline for me, um, which is not super heavy, but still significant outlining, um, a lot of the story just gets fleshed out as I write. A lot of the, the characterization, and especially a lot of the world building, gets fleshed out as I write. And, and some of his critiques were, you know, the world building is quite as strong, and I knew that that stuff was going to come out as I wrote the draft. Um, but, but just getting that response from him really was like a bummer for me, yeah. and uh, kind of uh, tanked my enthusiasm my enthusiasm for the project, which I'm, at, once I finish this revision for my current series, I'm going to go back to that novel, and I think it's it is going to be fine. I'm, I'm really excited to go back to it, but but it did kind of uh, hinder my process, my, my progress for a while, and so it's it's something to consider, and something you have to learn and understand for yourselves. Um, I have a lot of friends who discovery write and use writing groups, you know, just constantly submitting stuff, and it really works for them. That's awesome. It doesn't work that way for me, though. Maybe I'm doing the agenting thing wrong, but every time I have the phone call, I always explain that there probably are revisions coming up. Um, <laughs> um, but I come from editorial side, too, so I do work through, um, especially the first novel, going through that entire revision process with, with them. And even with writers who have been writing for years and have written several manuscripts, um, I think working with a professional the first time is enlightening, because each of them, that first novel, I have to help them understand the process of going through and having you know, an editor, um, work with an editor on that. Um, so I think it is um, a little bit diff 
different. And maybe we can discuss, you know, what, yeah, how, how it works to work with, you know, our editor or agent um, instead of just necessarily revising on your own. Yeah. So my editor makes me work really hard. <laughs> and But she does it the right way. Sometimes I'm like, just tell me the answer. But because what she does is um, she usually asks a lot of questions instead of like saying, here's what you need to do, fix. I'm like, uh, when, we're, when I've turned in like a finished novel and she's giving me, like every page has like these questions on it and stuff like that. And so I have to put a lot of deep thought into like, okay, what's the core problem here, and how do I fix it, instead of like her, you know, she will say things like, this scene could be a third shorter, or like, you know, things like that, but um, she really digs deep into the character philosophy. I told her she needed like an honorary like PhD or something after mm. revising my first book. Um, so we spend a lot of time digging into Character psychology. She's really hard with me on. She's really with like pacing and urgency. Again, it's like young adult. And I'm with Catherine Teagan Books. They're an imprint of Harper Collins, and they're kind of like this blend of literary and commercial fiction. Um, so like, oh, so many of my beautiful <laughs> similes and metaphors have to go that I spent so long. You know, I, I kill a lot of darlings. But yeah, for her, I do. Yeah, and sometimes. I need to like, sometimes I do need like a little bit more specific, like, not like her give me the answer, but can you just clarify what is the underlying core problem here? Because if you are having like your friends critique for you or, or anyone, if they're telling you, and every once in a while my editor will say, will give me like a, here's how I think you should fix this. But that's almost always, Wrong? I'm not, I'm not necessarily with her, but like really what you need to know is like what the underlying problem is. Um, sometimes they think, sometimes they think just really after reading it, you know, once or twice, here's how you can fix that. But as you as the writer is like, no, if I change that thing there, that's going to domino into all these things and it won't, that won't be consistent. Um, so there's, there's always more than one solution. So it's really important to understand the core problem of the big picture edits. Um, so that's kind of how we work <coughs> together. Um, and I've done like, all of my books are with her. I've done, I just, I'm just finished revising the fourth one with her. We do, you know, I do a lot of heavy revising. Um, but I feel, and sometimes I'm like cursing her. She, why did you not make me think so hard? <laughs> but I always feel really confident by the time we're done that, and I trust her that we've produced. Um, maybe it's something that won't, won't satisfy everybody, but I feel I feel satisfied that I did the very best of my ability with someone that I really trust that made me work really hard and dig really deep. Um, so. Even though the process is long and, and hard, I, I, I love the end result with her. I've had um, several different editors over the years, and, and really, this, the way that she's talking is the way that I have found is the best for me also. Say, they say, they'll either say something like, this doesn't really make a, lo uh, a lot of sense. Can you clarify, or can you, um, I don't feel this, or something, or they'll just ask, you know, some kind of a question. But one time, I, I want, <laughs> when you said that they don't often can't actually tell you what the problem is, sometimes that's the case, and they'll just, like, I remember one of my editors saying, this, this drags, this part drags. And I read through it and I thought, it has to be there. It has to be there because if it doesn't, it's going to ruin 10 other things down the road. I have to have it there. And so I just rewrote it and added, like doubled it. And then I sent it back to the editor and she said, oh, this is perfect. And I'm like, you told me to just cut it out because she had. She said, I think you just need to cut this out or part this out. And I said, I can't, you know. And so... Uh, one thing one of my editors said to me, she goes, you always know how to fix things. And, and as the author, you will. Because they'll tell you that something's wrong here, and you'll realize that it's not there you need to fix. Maybe it's a little bit above. And so that they have the understanding that when they get to that point, that makes sense. And so that's what the, uh, the editors do. If you, have, if you can get editors that do that, that's, you know, that say, I ha we have this problem, this needs to be fixed, they recognize that, and then you, ha you know, you 
if you feel strongly about something, fight for it and talk to them and say more clarification because you don't, they don't want your story ruined any more than you do. Yeah. yeah. I, so I've been fortunate to work with two uh, really brilliant editors uh, on my book so far, and, and they're, like, they're so, their intelligence is far, far above mine. Um, like I freely admit that they are very smart people. Um, and, uh, but, but the thing is, and then they've had some great suggestions that have absolutely been you know, so beneficial for, for my books. Um, but they, uh, but but they don't know my books like I do, right? And that's that's I think a confidence that we should have as as authors. Nobody knows our books like we do. The, you know, the people we're writing them, right? We know the characters in a way that nobody else does. We know the story and the setting in a way that nobody else does. Now they can point out ways that we're maybe not conveying that. At, you know, in the best way, and that's important. That's good feedback that helps us understand. Oh, I see. I know this is a thing, but I'm not conveying it to my audience in a way that they know it's a thing. Right? That's great feedback. Um, but but it's it's. Uh, I, I think it's uh, easy sometimes for writers, at least for me, to fall back into like, ah, this person is just really intelligent. They know what they're talking about. I'm just going to go along with what they say. Right? And in reality, that's not necessarily true. Um, and I've. I mean, I take probably. I'm going to kind of go down the line here because I think there's a number of different feedback forms that I have that I take varying degrees of. Like, for, for example, my, my um, agents and editors are, are great. They're very smart people. They know story very well. And I take a, anywhere between 60 to 90% of what they say and basically do it because they're usually right. Um, now that, you know, seven, whatever the number is, I'm not a math person, 30 to 10% or backwards of that? 40, 40 to 30, thank you, um, of, of, you know, whatever. I don't like of theirs, I say, hey, uh, here's my issue with this suggestion or with this change. Um, here's what I'm thinking. And, and almost always, again, I think I've been fortunate because I've heard stories where this doesn't work as well for the writer. But I've been very fortunate in that my editors say, oh, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, and then we maybe change it in a way that, that's more clear that that's what's going on or whatever. But, but, uh, but yeah, so that works out for me. Um, now, uh, writing groups and beta readers are a little bit different. Um, beta readers, I take anywhere from like 40 to 50% of what they say. And writing groups, uh, you know, I take maybe like 15% of what they say. And that's okay. Like, I, I, like that 15% is great stuff that really helps me. And I don't think the rest is a waste, right? Like, it's, it's important. I, I find it helpful to even just be in a writing group and talking about writing with other writers. Like, that's a valuable thing to me. Um, so I, I've never viewed my writing group as a waste. And there are a few people in my writing group whose feedback is always much more helpful than, than everybody else's. But, uh, but I think uh, it, it's, it's a matter of finding that balance, right? And, and seeing, OK, you know, I know that these people give me really amazing feedback. Uh, and these people give me feedback that is almost always right, but also having that confidence as a writer to say, you know what, I know this, I know what's going on here, and maybe I'm not conveying it as well as I could or should, but this is not the right suggestion, and I need to think of a new one, right? So. Yeah. My editor will often say, like in her editors, let me help you write the story I think you're trying to tell. <laughs> like, go to, nice try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. I thought maybe it would be helpful for you guys to hear like some specific suggestions she's given me when I've had to like do more heavy rewriting. Um, because I, it's hard when you, when you put so much time into pre-writing and outlining and actually get the book out, and when you do have to rewrite it to like reconcept it, it's really hard to like switch gears from something that's so ingrained, like a structure that I've so ingrained in my head. So um, a couple things, every book is kind of different, every book will have different problems, but one thing she had me do is like, because I, I tend to get in this really elaborate outlining process and we don't usually have time for that in a rewrite and with deadlines and stuff, so she'll say like make two columns and one's um, external like outline the book with bullet points from an external problem point of view and then like the internal arc of the character and I'll and I'll just do it side by side and then you don't want to like necessarily have one scene per thing like you're going to try to blend those internal and external as much as possible in your in your scene work um, but that's something to help me kind of like 
break down the new flow. And she, what she's really looking for is that there should like, you should feel like an, an engine like, or propeller like pushing everything forward. Like everything needs to feel like it's got forward momentum. Everything needs to be there for a reason, have a purpose. Um, another thing, when we, when we were talking about, like, sometimes she'll say, like, this scene's dragging, you know, and, and I look at them, like, that was my favorite scene, she didn't like that, <laughs> but sometimes it's just, like, the order of scenes, yeah. Yeah. Um, because, like, maybe it was, like, two quiet scenes or three quiet scenes in a row, so, like, this really cute, romantic, or whatever, like, scene that was, like, a, or, like, a more, just kind of sit down, have a conversation scene, it didn't have the effect that I wanted it to as a in my conceptualizing of the story because it followed too many quiet scenes. So like for the book I just finished uh, revising, Bone Grace, I just went through the whole revising process with my editor. For that one, I didn't have to, like the plot was all right and everything like that, but we needed to like, she kept on saying like almost every chapter in the middle was like more urgency, more urgency. Like she wanted the same things in the scene to happen and that's like all she would say sometimes and I'd be like, okay. Another chapter, completely different <laughs> kind of scene, more urgency, you know? So what I did is I, I listed out all my scenes like in an Excel spreadsheet, and, and then I just flagged if they're like an action-driven scene or more of a quiet scene, you know? Or, and sometimes they were like uh, a mesh in between, and sometimes it was just a matter of switching the order. So I like switched the order of that scene, and then in the second pass when she read it again, she, like all these notes, oh, Scene. She loved everything about it. The scene was pretty much the same, but just in a different place in the book, like just like one or two chapters earlier or later, something like that. So you want to make sure that as far as pacing goes, um, that you've got a, a nice, for the most part, try not to have two quiet scenes in a row. Um, and again, a lots of times we think, I'll tend to, because I'm the overwriter that has to come back and pull it all together, try as much as possible for your scenes to achieve more than one thing. Like you can be moving that internal objective forward at the same time you're moving the external one forward. And the times you can do that, the scenes are going to be more interesting and more compelling. Um, you have something to say because you picked up. Oh yeah, I did. I picked up. Well, I, I just want to. I, I love that. Like, like having your scenes do more than one thing, especially yeah. in revision. It's almost like I don't like my favorite part of the process is drafting. Like the first draft, personally, I just think that's the most fun. But what I love about revision is is it's almost like a puzzle. Like, yeah. um, like, like fixing the most the largest amount of problems with like the least amount of words is like kind of a fun puzzle I can do in revision and be like, okay, I have these problems and I list them out. I'll have a big list on my screen and I'm like, okay, what can I do uh, that can fix all these problems, right? And in, in the second book, I, I was kind of despairing because I was like, there are so many problems in this book and it's just like, how am I gonna even, but then I, I sort of found this, like, it's not a loophole, but it's like this shortcut where I was able to just add a scene and tweak a few other scenes and suddenly it fixed like more than half of my problems. And it was this really cool moment where I was like, all right, like all my problems are gone. I didn't have to like rewrite half the book, you know? This is cool, like it's, it's a fun thing. Um, yeah. Um, we're almost out of time, but um, one thing I wanted to mention that we haven't touched on yet is over revising. Um, and that is when you take... Is there advice. such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> and you, can, you, can, you can ruin a book with over-revising. There was one book that I got in that it was a beautiful manuscript, very literary, and just this wonderful thing, but the second half needed an entire overhaul. And so I you know, wrote back to the writer and explained what the problems were and said, I'd love to see it again if you revise based on what I said. And he um, emailed me back saying, oh, another agent just gave me revision notes. And I said, oh, okay, well, let me take a look. Mm -hmm. The other agent had tried to change it from a literary novel into an action thriller <laughs> and it changed everything and I was just yeah. almost devastated I was like this beautiful thing is destroyed and so I emailed the author back and said okay this you know it, it looks like what that other agent recommended is going to make this you know to um to a thriller and not into a literary novel and if you want to revise uh, you know I'm happy to work with you and help you through this but you're gonna have to ignore everything they said and then you know it's gonna have to be you know a guide you this way and he's like oh okay so I gave him some notes and he came back and it just every time it kept getting worse and so I finally had to tell him I'm sorry um, send me something in the future but oh. this one I can't help it anymore and so it ruined it because he was taking advice from everyone and changing it based on that 
And so like with critique groups, when you hear it, if you hear the advice, or I tell my authors that if you hear the same rejections coming from editors, more than two or three people, then you know there's a problem there and you need to address it. Don't necessarily just do what they say. So you want to find the problems with the um, critique groups. Don't change everything. And I think yeah. Christopher touched on that as well. Don't just change things when someone says something. So, okay. Yeah. You just have to, I mean, you do need to be open for feedback, but you have to remember, you just have to hold on to the integrity of your project. It sounds, I mean, I think you could revise forever if you had a, a, a single-minded goal and someone you trusted that you're working with, but it sounds to me like they were just maybe trying to sell a book and willing to do whatever. <coughs> and there's nothing wrong with a thriller, but she wanted a literary novel, so it's like, yeah. Well, it was, the book, it's Itself had originally been a literary novel, and the revisions that the person had changed it to yeah. something else. And so, you, um, I guess part of my point is you have to trust your own instincts, yeah. and you have to write the book you want to write. And with publishing, they're interested in commercial; they're trying to sell books. And so, but the comments often you'll get is to try and make yeah, it more upcoming. sellable. But yeah. you still Thanks. have to make sure that the book you're writing is what you want to write. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, can I just add one thing really fast? When she was saying you don't have two slow scenes, it can also happen the other way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah too sure. many. I wrote a, a story called Ti um, Times Nine. It's a subscriber exclusive on my website. And every time I had people read that before, they said, yeah, but it's just too tense. I, mm -hmm. I'm too stressed. And so I had to actually go back and add slow scenes in the middle. So yeah. that's all I wanted to yeah, add. No, totally. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, so I'm an underwriter, so... She's what an underwriter, which is really common. <laughs> an underwriter. Mm -hmm. You look in your first draft, and then once you have it, what do you do? Like, do any of you guys underwrite? Maybe the underwriter should ask, answer the question. No. I so what, what? What's the question? I have. I have under. Oh, I have underwritten in the past. I don't okay. al always necessarily. But. In your first draft, what do you really try to include? And then once you're done with your first draft, what do you do next? Like really specifically. Yeah. So in my first draft, I always try to include um, the the main beats as I as I understand them. Right. The main structure of a story. Um, I I, I want to suggest something here, and that's uh, a book by Sean Coyne, C-O-Y-N-E, called The Story Grid. And I love this book for two reasons. One, because it talks uh, in a very specific level about revision. And it's actually very technical, and it's something that not everybody should or would want to do, but it, it's very helpful. And then he also talks about globally like some important aspects to hit in a story. And those are the things that I always try to do in a first draft, always. Because if I'm missing one of those major components, it's not a story yet. There's also a really good book by James Scott Bell called Revision and Self-Editing. It's my favorite craft book and I really like it because he doesn't shame if you're a pantser or a plotter. He kind of addresses both needs and how to work both ways. Yeah. And, and everything beyond the, those main story points, uh, especially things like subplots. Subplots more than anything are things that I, if I, if I leave anything out for to just write in revision, it's things like subplots and side characters. And so. one final um, I guess resource I have for revising, I tell every writer, all my writers to read it, is Self-Editing for Fiction Writers by Rennie Brown and Dave King. Oh. And with that one, once you have the manuscript, you go through each chapter and revise based on what they have. And it's another one, don't necessarily use everything they have, but there are certain sections that are just fantastic and that have helped writers. I've seen it 100% different, like, change and made it so much better based on that. Super. All right, well, thanks for coming, everyone.